you doing, folks? I'm the GM Zalco. I've got another refight episode for you. We're playing the Battle of Tiffinum from SPQR, GMT's game of Wars of the Roman Republic. And we're having a good fight so far. We're still in turn one. And we're about to see what uh, the Roman commander, Rulianus, does next. Uh, in this episode, we'll dig into some of the shock combat mechanics, basically melee and close combat. Um, we'll see where and how effective the Romans are in this part of the game. So let's jump into the fight, folks, and roll some dice. Now, before we go any further, it pays to look at the line command eligibility chart. These are found with each scenario. They tell us what troops can make up a single line and eligible for a line command. On the case of the Romans, we can see that a line command can be made up of all velites. Another option is hastati, which can be citizen or non-citizen. Another option is principe, again, citizen or non-citizen units. And another one is triari, and another one is cavalry. And we have something similar for the Samnites. Uh, a line can be made up of all light infantry. Another one can be van and medium infantry units. They can all make up a line. Uh, another one is main units and heavy infantry. They can make up a line command. Another one is cavalry. So in other words, when you want to issue a line command to a group of units, you have to make sure the units that make up that line and receive the line command are one of these options listed here in the chart. Uh, you wouldn't be able to say include cavalry and triari in a single line command. They couldn't move as a group and receive a line command. But if they were all triari, there you go. If they were all cavalry, you're good too. So that's how you find these uh, combinations and how it works with line commands. It's found with each scenario. There we go. So before we go any further, I just want to clarify a couple things. Uh, first of all, in order to attempt a trump, uh, you have to choose a leader from your side who has an equal or greater initiative rating. And that's important. Um, he also has to be not have been previously activated, in other words, finished. Uh, in addition, you can attempt to trump a trump. So in our example here, we've got Rulianus, who was successful at trumping Pontius over here. Uh, Rulianus could be trumped. The Samnites do get the opportunity to attempt a trump against Rulianus. You'd basically choose one of his two commanders who have equal or greater initiative uh, to attempt it with. He makes the d10 roll. He has to score under his initiative. If he's successful, Rulianus becomes finished. He's flipped to his finished side. He never gets a chance to do anything. And the Samnite leader would thus be activated. However, if the Samnite leader fails the Trump attempt, he becomes finished and he's flipped. So he therefore never gets a chance to do anything in the turn. Uh, another thing is that during each activation, each side only gets a single trump attempt. Uh, that's important to know. So Rulianus only had one attempt. The player only had one attempt at a trump during this activation, which was Pontius's activation. Same with uh, the Samnites. He would have only one trump attempt during this activation. Again, Pontius's activation. So, yeah, there is that. It's a really fun mechanic, really great mechanic. I think it really uh, emphasizes the importance of command, the leadership of your generals in an ancient's battle. It does a really, well, good job at it, and it's really fun. A little bit of gambling and risk involved, you know. Uh, really, you don't want to do too many trumps unless you're fairly confident in its use or... You know, it's it's really important, like you know, to prevent a unit that just successfully used momentum or a leader that used momentum from doing a sweeping flank move that could be devastating for your army. Maybe a trump attempt is worthwhile, uh, but you got to be careful. So at least that's from my experience. So yeah, there is that. So next up in activation, of course, is Rulianus because of his successful trump against Pontius's uh, successful momentum. Uh, so he gets to take action. Now, at this point, he has a choice. He can issue line commands or he can issue individual orders commands. And one thing I haven't covered is individual orders. Now, he has up to one line command he can give. He has to be within two hexes uh, of at least one unit from the line and in line of sight. That would be the triari. He's too far away from these guys to move them again. Remember, they've already moved. They would take cohesion hit. 
uh, if they move a second time. Uh, so we're not going to do that. Basically, what we want to do is focus on individual orders. And the first order we're going to give is for him to move. All leaders have a movement of nine. It's not printed on their counters. They just have nine movement points to spend in the turn, or in the activation, I should say. So what I want to do with him is spend his nine movement points to move up somewhere in this area, in a central position, bring as many of these uh, lesser commanders, leaders in the Roman army under my command range, which is six hexes away, just for the next turn's benefit. So I'm going to do that. All right, I didn't make his move. I put him right here. That was one individual order. So we're not moving on to the Samnites yet because he has, up to his initiative rating, that is the number of individual orders he can issue. So he used one to move. So he's got four more for the turn. It's pretty cool. You can use that for things like rallying uh, units that are routed. You can use it for uh, recovering units that have taken cohesion hits. You can issue, you can have units fire or move or move and fire, like we saw with the light infantry of the Samnites. You can do all those cool things. And these are all the things you can do with that. Uh, not a whole lot to do at this point. So we take a closer look here. And... He doesn't have a whole lot of options. I don't want to do too much this early in the battle. Um, however, one this guy's out of his uh, command range. You can't give him an order. He's off by one hex. wasn't paying attention. Otherwise, I might have moved him on the flank of this light infantry and engaged in combat here at a substantial advantage. However, I think the only thing I want to do, since everything is moved and I don't want to incur any more cohesion hits on him for moving uh, subsequent times, what I'm going to do is I'm going to end this. I, I could use recovery, or could I? No, I can't use recovery. This unit here has taken a hit, a cohesion hit. You can just see it underneath the counter. And one of the things he can do is have that unit recover that one hit. However, because I am adjacent to an enemy unit, I can't do that. I am in clear terrain, which is the second requirement to use recovery but I am adjacent to an enemy, so I can't attempt recovery here. So that's a no-go. And the same applies all, all the way through here. Uh, so I think what we're going to do, before we mark him as finished, I'm going to end the movement and missile fire segment and go to the shock combat segment, and maybe we could demonstrate some combat. And basically, uh, there's no shock must-check TQs. Nobody that moved that has to shock did so. Uh, but I can mark anyone within his command range of six hexes that's adjacent to an enemy or has an enemy within its zone of control, which these Velites do. So do these two Velites. Uh, so does this Velite. As long as they're within six hexes, they can be given a shock, uh, no TQ check. In other words, they can engage in shock combat. And I think I'll look at this and I'll mark them. So as you can see, I've marked those two units right here. I put the counters behind them. They're within my command range of six hexes. And I'm basically telling them, engage in shock. Let's do some fighting. And both of these Velite units are adjacent to this light infantry unit. They can shock him. Uh, they have that light infantry within their frontal zone of controls. Uh, so they can do that. And this takes us right into the shock phase. In fact, the first thing you do in shock phase is mark units like this. And then we go through the sequence of shock combat. So they're the only two units I want to engage in shock combat. I could do others, but this is the only spot I think it's appropriate because we have a numerical advantage. we got two units going against one, both frontally. Uh, we'll see what happens. Keep in mind that when I do this, I'm no longer able to use my missile shooting capabilities. And if this battle becomes drawn, these units involved will be marked as engaged, uh, and that'll carry over. Uh, and I won't be able to shoot until this is resolved. So there is that threat. But to demonstrate some shock combat, I'm going to have these two Velites engage those light infantry in some sword play. So let me show you how that goes. Okay, once you've marked units within command range of the activated leader who you want to engage in shock combat, mark them with a shock no TQ check, like I did. Next thing to do is to check for leader casualties, uh, which can happen. This is done before we resolve the close combat. 
folks. That's a little different. And basically, you roll d10 if it comes up zero. You roll again on a chart. This table right here, leadership casualties, and then you consult this table. It tells you what happened. I could be wounded. All kinds of things can happen there. But there's no leaders stacked with a unit that's involved in shock combat, those two Velite units. Uh, so we skip that. The next thing we do is we go through this three-step process uh, of re resolving the close combat. And if we take a look here, it involves three separate tables. First thing you do is you check the Clash of Spears and Swords chart. Basically, you look up the angle of attack. If it's either from the front or if it's from the flank or if it's from the rear. You look up the defender, where he falls in here, whether he's heavy infantry, uh, barbarian infantry, light infantry, skirmishers, heavy cavalry. You look up that defender's class right here. It's called the Defender's Weapon Class. Cross-reference that with the Attacker's Weapon Class, or type. And they're coded up here in the top. Uh, in our case, we have Light Infantry from the front. So we use this row. Light Infantry from the front going against uh, Light Infantry, which are the Roman Velites, which are right here. This tells you which shock combat results table we're going to use. So you write that down. It's a 7 in this case, which is pretty 50-50-ish. The next thing we do, step 2, is we go to the shock superiority chart. This is where we see if one side or the other, the attacker or the defender, has superiority, either in position or in a tactic or weapon system. And first you check for position superiority, which applies if you're attacking them on the flank or on the rear. You automatically have superiority. The attacker would. It's not the case here. Both of my Vilites are attacking from the front uh, against an opponent facing me. So it's, it's no superiority for position. So we have to look at their weapon types. And we look, like before, we look up the defender's class here, or his type. He's light infantry. And we cross-reference that with the, the attacker, which again is light infantry. In this case, dash means there's no advantage, no superiority to either side. So, yeah, that's that. And none of this other stuff applies. But there's a good look at it. And once you've done this, this is step two, we go down here to shock combat results table. Now, we already know which column we're using. Seven. The clash of spears and swords chart told us that. So we're going to be consulting this. This can be shifted left or right. The right favors the attacker. The left favors the defender uh, based on certain circumstances, like if the attacker or the defender is depleted as we could see down here, depletion. Any attacking unit is depleted, one column shift to the left. Uh, if any defending unit is depleted, it's one column shift to the right, favors the attacker. So there are adjustments for that. Uh, there's also a size ratio difference, which you have to check. So let's take a look at the sizes of the forces involved, and we'll see if there's going to be any shifts because of that. Well, the first thing we want to do is check out the sizes of these units. Now, these units, we'll look at the attacker first. Uh, there is a stat on these counters. It's in the center of the counter, and it is their size rating. It's that little three there. You can kind of see it right there. That number, three, is their size rating. So we have a three. Now, because this guy is also attacking, his size is added to his which is four, so it's a total of seven. And if we look at the defender, his is a four. So it's seven to four, and we turn that into a ratio. And the way we do this is we're gonna round off. Now, if the attackers moved in order to initiate shock combat, it's gonna round off in the favor of the attacker. They didn't move. Otherwise, it rounds off in favor of the defender. So with a ratio of seven to four, that is going to round down in favor of the defender. It's going to be one to one odds in this case. If it had rounded in the favor of the attacker, the seven to four would have rounded to two to one odds. So it's going to be a one to one odds because it rounded in favor of the defender. So unfortunately, that's not going to help out the Velites in this attack.
Now, getting back to the table here, if we see where we were, once you've got the size ratios figured out, uh, you know the column, uh, and you know which side is superior, neither side in this case. If you're superior, you know, usually do more casualties and that kind of thing. Neither side is superior in this case, so we're going to skip that. Uh, the size difference is one to one, so there's no shifts, column shifts. That's what size differences or advantages have. Uh, yeah, for every one, for every, for example, if we were at two to one odds in favor of the attacker in this case, that would result in a one column shift to the right in favor of the attacker. Um, basically, how far above one to one odds you are converts to a shift in your favor. Two to one would be one column shift to the right. Uh, one to two would be one column shift to the left, that kind of thing. But there is no advantage there. So basically what you're going to do is you're going to look down this column seven. You're going to roll a d10 to see which one applies. Uh, the results are written as attacker cohesion hits. Uh, and in parentheses, the defender's cohesion hits, whatever the result is. There is modifiers to the die roll. As we can see here, there's modifiers if generals involved. They get to add their charisma rating, which again is on the counter. Uh, phalanx units have special modifiers, which are column shifts. Uh, there's also terrain adjustments, which again are column shifts. There's no terrain that factors in here. No commanders are involved. We're not dealing with phalanxes. There's no size differential involved here. No units are depleted, and neither side has any kind of superiority. So none of this will apply. It's going to be a straight up die roll under the seven column. Pretty 50-50 iffy odds if you ask me. Uh, and we'll see what happens. So let's make that die roll. All right, here we go. D10, and we get a five. All right, now that we have our die roll result, we have to consult our shock combat results table once again. And again, we go down this row here until we find five. That's what we rolled. Uh, there was no modifiers. And we look at the seven column. And the result is two cohesion hits to the attacker and two to the defender. Two and two. So that's our result. Now let's see how that translates to the counters on the tabletop. All right, so it's two hits to the attacker. So we're going to put a counter down here to each of these. Now, when there's more than one attacker, uh, the hits are divided equally amongst those involved in the combat. If there is any odd leftover cohesion hits, they go on the unit that was initially designated as the attacker at the start of combat. And again, uh, at the start of every combat, the attacker chooses which of his units, if there's more than one, is the main attacker. And that unit will be used for determining superiority in the Clash of Spears and Swords chart that we referred to earlier. Same thing with the defender. He, if there's more than one, he chooses the one. If units are stacked, it's always the top unit that's used to determine that. If the attack is coming through the front, uh, if it's coming through the rear, it's the back unit, and so on and so forth. But in this case, it's pretty simple. There's two cohesion hits, one on him, one on him. Easy. And of course, the defender receives two as well. That will add to whatever cohesion hits they've taken already. This unit took two cohesion hits previously from shooting, so it's now at four. Its TQ is five, so it's pretty close to breaking. Not good. Special rule for that, and we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, the other units have taken one cohesion hit already from shooting, so they're both at two. Now, with two cohesion hits and a TQ of five, both of these Velite units, they're safe. They're not going to route from the combat. Anybody, any unit that matches its TQ or exceeds it in cohesion hits will route. Um, it's not the case here. However, one of the final things we do in combat, once we've applied the cohesion hits, routed any units that have exceeded their co TQs in cohesion hits, uh, the next thing to do before units advance into vacated hexes, where uh, defenders have routed from, before we do that, any unit that is in an enemy zone of control, which this unit is, uh, that is one away from matching its TQ, in cohesion hits. This unit is at four. It has a TQ of five. That 
means it qualifies for this special rule. It has to make a TQ test rolling under its TQ of 5, the printed value on the counter. If it does so, it reduces its current cohesion hits it has, this unit is at 4 so far, by 1. So it will be knocked down to 3 instead. And he holds his ground and all units will be uh, marked with engaged uh, counters to indicate they're in a continuously fighting melee. Uh, if they fail the TQ test, however, they exceed this value, their TQ, which is 5 for these Sam Knights, they automatically rout. So that's what happens when you're one away from matching your TQ in a shock combat. So let's make that die roll for him because he qualifies. And here we go. He has to roll under his TQ of 5. 4. He is safe. So what that means is that uh, his current cohesion hits he has accumulated, which is 4, will be dropped down to 3. And all those involved units will be marked with an engagement markers. So with the cohesion hits put underneath the counters, like I tend to do, we'll remove these shock no TQ markers because they're really there just for use at the beginning of the combat to show they don't have to make a TQ test prior to the start of the combat. Uh, they can be removed. Maybe you want to keep them there if there's a lot of combats going around. It might help you uh, to remember who's fighting who. And we'll mark all these units with engaged markers to show that they are engaged. They basically can't shoot, they can't move, and so on and so forth. They're stuck. There's special rules in the rule book. It's an optional rule, the engaged uh, counters, their use. And I tend to use it. It's very simple, very straightforward. And just for the sake of argument, uh, if this unit had failed that TQ test, he would have been marked as routed, one of these little markers right there. Uh, there'd, end, there'd end up being no engagement for any of these units. These counters would have been removed. But he would have been marked with a routed, and routed units have a TQ value of 1 from that point on. And he would immediately move two hexes, not movement points, but two hexes straight back towards his withdrawal edge, which is that direction for the Sam Knights. And he'd be facing that direction as well. And then, in addition, once that's done, the unit that was designated as the attacking unit will then advance into the hex vacated by the routed unit. And he can change his facing upon doing so. So, that would be the alternate result to this, if he had failed his TQ test, or if he had uh, ex matched or exceeded his... Uh, uh, TQ of 5 in cohesion hits as a result of this fighting, that was a possible result. But alas, it was not to be. He stood his ground and everybody was marked with engaged markers. And these guys will be fighting again. So that's a combat. At this point, uh, the shock combat segment of this activation, this orders phase, I should say, is complete. And it's at this point, Rulianus is in the momentum phase. He can choose to attempt momentum and do something again. Remember, he can use momentum up to twice. So he could do that. And his initiative is 5, so he'd have to roll a d10, scoring 5 or less. And if he's successful, uh, he activates. Or uses momentum, I should say. All right, and with that, I guess we'll make the attempt at a momentum check for Rulianus. I don't see why not. Both Semnite commanders are up next anyway. So we might as well make the attempt. However, I don't really want to do anything with the Romans by maneuvering them around, doing anything fancy. Uh, but let's keep in mind, one thing he can do uh, is at the end of his orders phase, the shock resolution segment. Uh, I can designate units that are adjacent to the enemy, or have the enemy within their zone of control, and that are within his command range of six uh, to engage in shock combat. No check TQ in this case. Uh, I could also move units into contact if I want. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to attempt momentum and do just that. So let's attempt the roll. I'm going to start using the white die for the Romans. Five or less. No modifiers in this case. He got a four. He gets momentum. So there you go. He's not finished. Let me flip him back over. I don't know why I flipped him. 
And he continues with a second orders phase. And we just repeat the whole process. He can now give orders once again. Hey, folks, and there we go. Once again, Rulianus is successful with momentum, and he's going to carry on with that. Uh, we'll see what he does. Maybe he's going to keep up the pressure and do some more close combat, maybe move up some of the troops from the other lines. We shall see. Uh, once he's done three activations, however, that's it for the turn, and it's time for the Sam Knights. And Sam Knights, of course, have two commanders, two leaders left to activate this turn, and we'll see how they respond to this. All right, folks, stay tuned. Hope you enjoy. Like, share, leave me some comments. If you have any questions on SPQR, leave them too. Uh, let me know what you think about the game and if you want to see more. And as always, folks, remember, hang in there. It's only going to get better. Till next time, folks, see you soon.